Hi, I'm Tom Long. This week on Island Meditations, I'm going to ask you to take a guess about something. Take a guess about what it is that I'm holding in my hands. If you can answer the question, what it is I'm holding in my hands, correctly in the comments below, I'll give you a shout out on next week's video. Now, I promise <laughs> that what, we, what I just said about guessing what I'm holding in my hands is gonna be relevant to the topic of today. This, is, this Sunday is going to be the 21st Sunday after Pentecost, and we're gonna be talking about Hebrews chapter four. And so before we delve into that, I need to tell you a little bit of a story. When I was a boy, I spent a lot of time at my grandparents. And when I would go to my grandmother's and spend the night, I would sleep in what had been my aunt's bedroom when she was a little girl. And one night I was lying there and I couldn't go to sleep. And I noticed that there was a book up on the wardrobe beside the bed. So I climbed up there and got the book and not knowing what it was. And I opened it planning to read. And what it turned out to be was a Bible. And not just any Bible, but a King James version of the Bible. And for those of you that don't know, that was published in 1611, that translation. Well, you know, my boyhood was a long time ago, but even then, a translation from 1611 was very archaic language and very unfamiliar to me as a boy. And yet, somehow, when I opened those pages and started to read, I can't even re remember what book of the Bible I was reading, but when I opened those pages and started to read, something happened that I was not expecting. Because as I opened that book and began to read those words, it was like there was another presence in that room with me speaking to my little boy heart, speaking to my little boy heart through the words on the page. And I had this sense of another being greater than myself, greater in wisdom, greater in power, a higher being than I was speaking to me through that Bible. So when I read in Hebrews 4, the word of God is alive and active. I feel like the person that penned those words must have had a similar experience with the written word of God as I had. She or he goes on to say that the word of God is sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. So the word of God is a sort of sword of God. It is so sharp, it separates things that are intertwined in a sort of Gordian knot. Things like our soul and spirit or our joints and bone marrow. It penetrates our spiritual and our physical being. In the Old Testament, the prophet Isaiah talked about God using a measuring line to find out what didn't fit in his kingdom and a plumb line to reveal what wasn't straight about God's people. Hebrews is saying that the Word of God is like the Old Testament measuring line and plumb line. It concludes the observation adding, nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of Him to whom we must give account. I'm not sure God cares what is in my hand, but I am sure He knows. <laughs> Theologians refer to this aspect of who God is as being omniscient. One of the confessions in the Psalms is found in Psalm 19, verse 12. But who can discern their own errors? Forgive my hidden faults. God knows things about us that even we don't know. And sometimes as we talk with God and read God's words, those hidden faults become known to us. Remember the story of the rich man in Mark 10? A rich man runs up to Jesus, falls on his knees, and, good teacher, he asks, what must I do 
to inherit eternal life. This poor soul had no idea what was lacking in his life, but he did know that something was off. This was a devout man who had kept the commandments since he was a child, but it hadn't filled his deepest longing. This is the only time in the Gospel of Mark that we are told that Jesus loved a specific person. The Bible says Jesus looked at him and loved him. But then out comes the Word of God, the sword of the Word that laid this man bare before himself and before God. One thing you lack, Jesus said, go sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. And we're told that the man went away sad because he had great wealth. When Jesus was praying to God the Father in John chapter 17, verse 3, he said, Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. He didn't say, know about God. He didn't say, know about Jesus. He said eternal life was to know, to experience an ongoing life-sustaining relationship with God, with Jesus. The problem with that relationship is that it means letting go of trusting in or giving value to anything ahead of our trust and worship worship of God. In her sermon, Letting Go, Mary Alice Crump of Grace Baptist in Richmond, Virginia, likens this transition to being like a trapeze artist. The trapeze artist must have the confidence that they can go from being supported by their current bar to being supported by the next bar. But they can't be supported by the next bar until they let go of the old one. But for us, it becomes as complicated as separating soul and spirit. Like the rich man, we might not even be aware of what it is that we're holding on to. But the good news is that whatever we might be grasping, willfully or unknowingly, God offers us grace. Hebrews reminds us that the Jesus who has ascended back to heaven can empathize with us because on earth he too had been tempted and tested, even though Jesus did not sin. God gets how challenging it is to be human, not just because he omnisciently knows all about it, but because God has experienced it as the incarnate God in Jesus. So Hebrews invites us with our willful or hidden grasping of things that hinder us from experiencing the fullness of eternal life. Hebrews invites us saying, let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Later in the same epistle, Hebrews says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Don't be afraid of the sword of the Word of God. Just as the scalpel of the surgeon can be the path to healing, the unveiling of our innermost being by the Word of God can open the path to eternal life in relationship with God. That sword may lay bare everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, but we can take what we're holding to the throne of grace and receive there the mercy and grace that will help us will meet our needs. Peter asks, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Paul wrote, you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. I don't know what you're hiding in your hand, let alone in your heart, but I invite you to pray this prayer with me. God, keep me reading your word. And when I don't like what is laid bare about myself there, give me confidence that I can come to you to receive mercy and find grace to help in my time of need. Thank you for joining me on my spiritual journey and reflecting with me on God's word in the context of the beauty of God's creation. 
I'm thinking of interrupting this series from the lectionary readings to take a few weeks to look at what I think are the most important scripture passages to help a person at various stages of their spiritual journey. Would you be up for that? Or would you rather we continue from the lectionary? Let me know in the comments. Thank you. God bless you in the week ahead. Sins and peace to God.